I'm Air Force Major Paul Max Moga from Air Combat Command's first fighter wing, and I fly the world's most advanced combat fighter, the F-22 Raptor. As the host of Showdown Air Combat, I'm going to take you to a place few people have ever been before right into the cockpit as we relive some of the most compelling dogfights of all time. In fact, I'll be flying in a chase plane to describe the action as we reconstruct these epic duels with restored versions of the classic warbirds that fought them. We'll also analyze the remarkable technical features, examine the groundbreaking tactics, and get to know the extraordinary pilots who flew these planes on the original missions. It will be an incredible journey. And I'm going to be your guide every step of the way. Welcome to Showdown Air Combat. A pair of F-4U Corsairs charge into a formation of Mitsubishi Zeros over the Japanese stronghold of Rabaul. Despite sending some of the enemy fighter planes down in flames, the Corsairs are quickly overwhelmed by a second group of Zeros. The F-4U is one of the best fighter planes of the war, and at the controls of the lead Corsair is one of the best fighter pilots of the war, Pappy Boynton. But as the action gets hotter, even Pappy seems to be losing ground to the still dangerous Zeros. In this dogfight, it looks like Pappy and his Corsair have got their backs to the wall. are often thought of as a breed apart. Fearless knights of the sky, battling in heroic single combat with the enemy. But although in many ways combat pilots are a little bit different, at least some of that image is a myth. Speaking from just a little bit of personal experience, those fighter pilots are hardworking, dedicated professionals who know the value of teamwork. Yet of all the great fighter pilots, one who fits the popular image to a T was Gregory Pappy Boynton. Individualistic, insubordinate, hard fighting, and hard shrinking. He lived life as fast as he shot down Japanese planes. Happy scored most of his victories while flying one of the best combat aircraft of World War II, the F-4U Corsair. With speed to burn, the Corsair was so deadly that Japanese pilots nicknamed it Whistling Death. But even late in the war, the Japanese Zero was still a formidable foe. It showed just how formidable on January 3rd, 1944, with Pappy Tango with a group of Zeros in the most dramatic and dangerous dogfight of his life. By early 1944, things are looking up for U.S. forces in the Pacific Theater. In the South Pacific, U.S. Army, Navy, and Marine Corps units are closing in on a key enemy bastion. The main Japanese base uh, in that um, theater was Rabaul, which is at the northern tip of New Britain, northwest of the Solomon Islands chain. The strategy was to march up the Solomon Islands to Rabaul. It boasted a lot of air defenses, a lot of air power. The bulk of the defensive air power at Rabaul is supplied by the venerable Japanese Zero. Flat out the best fighter in the Pacific during the beginning phases of the war, the Zero is by now starting to show its age. The Japanese have made some improvements to the plane, but the latest US designs have significantly closed the performance gap. Among the very best of these new American aircraft is the chance-bought F-4U Corsair. It's the first single-engine US fighter to exceed 400 miles per hour in level flight, achieving this distinction as a prototype in 1940. By comparison, even in early 1944, the most recent models of the Zero are still only in the mid-300s in terms of top speed. A big reason for this is the engine technology. The Japanese engine technology wasn't quite up to the par of what the U.S. had. The U.S. was already developing 2,000 horsepower class engines by 1940, so they were designing aircraft around engines of that much power by around that time, 1940-41. The Japanese don't get around to developing a similar powered engine until 1942. 
And so they're always trying to do more with less. For example, the Zero had an engine that's rated for about 980 horsepower. If you want good performance with an engine of only 980 horsepower, you gotta give up something. And what the Zero lacked was armor plate, self-sealing fuel tanks. Um, in the hands of a good pilot, you know, uh, it was a great machine. But that's another problem for the Japanese. By 1944, most of their best pilots have been lost in combat. Meanwhile, the U.S. is fully benefiting from huge increases in pilot training and aircraft production that are initiated just after America enters the war. The F-4U Corsair is part of this massive output of men and material. However, the plane suffers from several development problems, among the worst being the extreme difficulty of landing a Corsair aboard an aircraft carrier. Its 18-cylinder radial engine develops over 2,000 horsepower. This gives the Corsair a top speed of about 417 miles per hour. The plane quickly becomes extremely successful with the Leathernecks. And of all the Marine units to fly the Corsair, among the most successful is VMF 214, an outfit nicknamed the Black Sheep Squadron. It's commanded by a pilot who will ultimately become a legend, Major Gregory Pappy Bowington. Gregory Boynton arrived in the Pacific among a large group of replacement pilots. These were just pilots that were sitting in pools waiting for squadrons to open up for them to build. Boynton was at a commanding officer level as far as rank was concerned, and there were a group of pilots there, and what they essentially did was assume the number of VMF-214. As all squadrons do, they wanted to have an identity. Initially, the pilots of VMF-214 want to call themselves Boeington's Bastards. But figuring that won't sit too well with the brass, they settle on the less provocative name, the Black Sheep. And they had an insignia with a Black Sheep with a Corsair flying over. And really, the Black Sheep uh, indicated that they were mainly replacement pilots. And so they did not have a home when they were formed. However, this does not mean that all the black sheep are rookies. In fact, Boeington himself has already claimed six kills while serving in China as part of the famed American volunteer group known as the Flying Tigers. Several members of Boeington's new squadron also have at least some combat experience. They had kills between them. And so it wasn't like it was an inexperienced group of people that he was assuming command of. There were some who were fresh out of training back in the States, but there was a small group in there that could really form some good leadership and really make it an effective squadron. Under Boynton's command, the Black Sheep quickly become a key unit, spearheading the aerial assault on Rabaul. And there were intense air battles over Rabaul, some of the most heated in the Pacific War. Now, Boynton's career was leading his squadron and leading strikes to support the bombardment of Rabaul in the attempt to neutralize it, and it was very much a target-rich environment for them. But the Corsair drivers can also be targets for the swarms of Zeros helping to defend Rabaul. So just who has the upper hand in this contest? To answer that question, let's take a look at the technical features of both planes. The Mitsubishi Zero was 29 feet 9 inches long, with a wingspan of 39 feet 4 inches. Its 14-cylinder radial engine develops over 1,000 horsepower. This gives the latest models of the Zero a top speed of about 350 miles per hour. The F4U-1A Corsair is 33 feet 4 inches long, with a span of 41 feet. Its Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP engine generates 2,000 horsepower. This drives the Corsair to a top speed of around 417 miles per hour and a ceiling of almost 37,000 feet. From this comparison, it's easy to see that the Corsair has a huge edge in both horsepower and speed. But the Zero still has some advantages of its own. Let's take a look at the real planes and see what they've got. So this is my first time in a Corsair cockpit. And really, the, the first thing that I recognize is that I'm, well, I'm sitting pretty high up. But most significantly, I'm sitting pretty far back from the prop. And I mean, I can see how this would have presented some 
unique challenges to the pilots that were trying to land this aircraft on an aircraft carrier because at a certain point you won't be able to see the wires. So you just got to kind of trust in God that you're going to hit them. As far as the cockpit itself, man, it, it is really laid out very, very nicely. Uh, and it all makes sense to me. You know, you've got the, the throttle and the prop and the mixture over here on the left. You've got the gear handle, you've got the flaps. You've got the RPM, the altimeter, the manifold pressure. All your gauges are laid out in, in front of you, and you sit at a pretty at a pretty good height. So you've got some good visibility when you're when you're looking around trying to scan the the horizon for bandits. You know, this is such a well laid out cockpit, and it's got such great you know visibility and such strong offensive and defensive capabilities that I can really understand how excited these guys were to just get in this plane, get airborne and get the job done. The electronics in the cockpit of the Corsair seem light years ahead compared to other planes of this era. Let's take a closer look inside the cockpit of the Zero to see its capabilities. So let's just kind of go around the cockpit a little bit. Sure. What are these wheels over here in the, in the bottom left? Well, those are the trim. That's a rudder trim you see, and then the elevator trim with all those bicycle chains. And it's actually, I mean, like, like you said, it looks just like a bicycle That's chain. exactly right. All it is is a chain hooked to a cable that goes back to a little drum in the back, and it just cranks a screw jack and makes the trim tabs move. It's pretty simple. Yeah. And, and Sitting another, in the uh, cockpit of the Zero, it feels like antiquated and out of date compared to the Corsair. It's hard to believe they battled against each other in the same war. And just years earlier, the Zero was considered the dominant warbird. This is 1939 design, and you know, you sit in this and you go back in time. It's, uh, we call this kind of an agricultural approach. It's like being in a tractor. A tractor that can fly, and one of the greatest fighter planes of its era. But all that means absolutely nothing to Pappy Boeington during his dogfight in 1944. All he wants is to whack some zeros and get home alive. To do it, he'll need every technical capability his F4U Corsair has got. And then some. Pappy Bowington's dogfight with a group of Japanese zeros over a ball in 1944 is far more than a test of piloting skills. It's also a battle between aircraft and technologies. On one side, there's the Mitsubishi Zero, which early in the war was the undisputed champion of the skies in the Pacific. But by 1944, the technological edge that helped make the Zero dominant has almost disappeared. Built to maximize its offensive capabilities, the Zero is maneuverable and well-armed. However, it lacks defensive features like armor plate and self-sealing fuel tanks, which are found in US fighters like the F4F Wildcat. Yet even though it's been overtaken by U.S. designs in many areas, the Zero is still an extremely effective dogfighter, especially at lower altitudes. On the other side, the chance-fought F4U Corsair is starting to carve out a legend of its own as one of the great naval fighters of its era. Like all other contemporary U.S. fighters, the 9,000-pound empty weight of the Corsair is considerably heavier than the 4,000-pound empty weight of the Zero. That means it needs an extremely powerful engine to keep up with a Japanese fighter in combat. Fortunately, the Corsair has one, and it's among the best aircraft power plants ever built. Good to see you again, Mark. Yeah, likewise, Max. So uh, here we are at the Corsair, and man, this thing is huge. This, this is a big plane, and it starts up front with the engine. So give me give me some stuff that you know about the engine. Yeah, it truly is immense. We've got a 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engine on the front of this thing. We got a prop that's being turned by this engine. It's 13 feet, one inches in diameter. Holy cow. I mean, it's got to be one of the larger engines of the day. So it, was the engine supercharged, turbo? What yeah, was it? There's no turbochargers on this. It's all supercharged, internally supercharged. And it's a 2,000 horsepower engine. Wow, I mean, is, is, is that fairly powerful for the day? Was it one of the most powerful engines when most it came Most powerful uh, aircraft at the time. The other airplanes that are comparable would be the P-47 Thunderbolt and the F-6F Hellcat. Both had the same R-2800 2,000 horsepower engine. Consisting of 18 cylinders arranged in two rows, the R-2800 Twin Wasp is a technological marvel when it's first produced in the late 1930s. At the time, aircraft designers, especially in Europe, preferred liquid-cooled inline engines, such as the Rolls-Royce Merlin, over air-cooled radials. That's partly because inlines have a smaller frontal area than radials, and thus produce less air resistance. 
but the R2800 generates so much raw power that it essentially negates this drawback. Lacking complex cooling systems, radials are also simpler to maintain than inlines. This is a big factor for naval fighters such as the Corsair, which are designed to be based aboard aircraft carriers, where space is at a premium. When the R2800 becomes available to chance fought in 1938, designer Rex Biesel and his team are given a simple mandate, to build the most streamlined yet rugged structure possible around the engine. They succeed wildly. In fact, when the prototype of the Corsair is flown in May 1940, it becomes the first US single engine production aircraft capable of topping 400 miles per hour in level flight. In addition to its high speed, the Corsair also proves to be an excellent performer at high altitude. The piece of technology that allows this is the engine supercharger. Superchargers are basically gas compressors that force more air, and thus more oxygen, into the combustion chambers of an engine as the altitude rises, and the ambient atmospheric pressure drops. Unlike the turbo superchargers on fighters such as the P-38 Lightning, which are powered by engine exhaust, the Corsair mounts a regular supercharger, which is driven directly by the crankshaft of the power plant. Not only does the supercharger improve the Corsair's high altitude performance, but it also gives the fighter a terrifying nickname. So, Mark, you mentioned those superchargers. Are these the, the intakes for the superchargers? Yeah, this is the intake for the, uh, the in intercooler for the superchargers and also an intake for the oil coolers. And uh, this intake, aerodynamically, is what gave this aircraft the uh, the whistling death nickname that it had because it had a high-pitched whistle when it would be coming down towards the Japanese. That's right, the whistling death. I remember hearing that before. The Mitsubishi Zero also has a supercharger, but in the later models, it's been upgraded to maximize engine performance to about 20,000 feet, whereas the Corsair supercharger allows it to maintain performance well above 20,000 feet. So the Corsair's massive R2800 engine and supercharger assembly and its equally big propeller give the plane distinct advantages in speed and altitude over the Zero. However, these very same features also present several unique challenges to the Corsair's designers, ones they solve in creative ways. So with such a huge engine, you got to build a plane that's fairly big around it, and you got to have a big prop to be able to, you know, curtail the power a little bit. But with a prop that's that big, I mean, look at how close it is to the ground. So how, how did they design this plane so the prop wasn't hitting the ground when it was spinning? Well, you'll see the inverted gall wing of the aircraft. And the reason for that is to make those gear make it all the way down to the ground, but without the gear being too long. If the gear had been real long and the gear goes to retract, it would hang out the back of the wing. Hmm. So instead of bringing the gear up to the wing, they brought the wing down to the landing gear. Wow, and I guess another reason that the gear have to be fairly short and squat is because I mean, this thing take off and land in a carrier, so you need to have some fairly sound structural features on your gear. Yeah, that gear would have to take a lot of landing force as this aircraft would come in and land. Wow. These airplanes were heavy, and uh, they would come aboard and tend to bounce aboard the carrier, so that gear had to be very stout. At the same time that the Corsair's designers are coming up with innovative solutions to their problems, the Zero's builders are trying to solve difficulties of their own, namely, how to keep their aging fighter competitive with newer enemy planes like the Corsair. Steve Hinton shows me the modifications to the Zero. This is a Model 52 or an A6M5. It has an uprated engine, it has shorter wingspan, um, it has a little less fuel to it, but it was faster. It has these exhaust pipes on this Model Zero. They put these individual stacks that converted some of the exhaust into thrust. They're called jet-style exhaust pipes. So they were using every bit of exhaust that came out of there, and actually they transitioned it or, or modified it so it could actually produce thrust? Exactly, yeah. This is probably the fastest of the Zeros. I think it had a top speed of around 350 miles an hour. Oh, how cool is that? You know, it's, it's kind of similar to the way we still develop, develop fighters today, where the, the airframe that you have when you develop it and field it is significantly different from the one you're faced with five years down the road. The Raptor that we're flying now is totally different than the Raptor that was first flown in, in 1990. We've already started putting new capabilities and upgrades on the plane. So that's, I mean, back then they did it because they were in a war. Now we're doing it just because if we have something better, we want to put it on the well, plane. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the Japanese, you know, I don't, they didn't expect the war to last. So uh, they, they, you know, they had a production line going with the Zero and it was established and going and to retool and make a different kind of airplane 
was really prohibitive. They did develop other aircraft, but they could just keep the zero line going and uh, just modify and do some significant changes along the way and still use the same tooling. Yeah, they just didn't know what they were getting themselves into, did yeah, they? they have a, I don't know what they were thinking. Look in the history books and it, it makes you kind of chuckle, really. In reality, however, this approach is not as foolish or short-sighted as it appears. Japanese war planners know that because of their country's more limited resources, they have no hope of defeating the United States in a protracted war of attrition. America's industrial might and vast reserves of manpower are just too overwhelming. So they stake everything on winning the war in one swift knockout blow. As a result, many Japanese weapon systems, and especially their aircraft, are designed to maximize their range and offensive capabilities, often at the expense of defense. But once the war becomes prolonged, the Japanese simply do not have the industrial capacity to keep up with U.S. production, nor can they fuel the multiplicity of new designs. So they're stuck with attempting a series of ad hoc modifications to existing designs, like the Zero. And yet, amazingly, in 1944, the Zero can still be a highly effective fighter plane. One of the reasons is the Zero's armament. Its two 7.7 millimeter machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannons remain extremely dangerous. But the Corsair's six wing-mounted 50 caliber machine guns can also be lethal. So you've got six 50 cals behind you if you're going in a gun of zero or something like that. Yeah, that's quite a punch there when you have the 650s. We got a Japanese zero that has no armor plate and is a lightweight little airplane. Those 650s could just tear through it in a heartbeat. Well, that's a great luxury to have. Now, the, I would assume most of the, the rounds were stored in the wings. Was there any fuel in there or anything else? No, the wings didn't have fuel. Just the, the inboard sections had fuel. And then most of the fuel was stored right forward of the cockpit. So not only do we have a big, huge engine, but also a big fuel tank in between the cockpit and the prop. Yeah, and that accounts for the length of this nose here. They have a fuel tank that they had to find a spot for. They found the best place for it that was right on the center of gravity of the airplane. So as the fuel burned down, the airplane's handling characteristics would remain constant. Now, I would think that, you know, besides the fact that you don't really want to have a fuel tank sitting right in front of you when you're, when you're flying a plane, for obvious reasons, that thing blowing up on you, but also, the further back you drive, I would think the little tougher it is to land, especially on a carrier. Yeah, because of the fuel tank, they put the pilot pretty far back. It's one of the, one of the airplanes that has the longest nose on it. Yeah, so it's really tough for a pilot to see where the wire is on the carrier when he's trying to land on it. You know, I heard that this plane was actually called the Ensign Eliminator. That's right. All new Navy pilots have the rank of Ensign. So the nickname, Ensign Eliminator, refers to the ensigns who either wash out of naval aviation, or worse, ones that can't land the hose-nosed Corsair on a carrier. It's a little bit of gallows humor, something US fighter pilots often use to make a dangerous situation seem a little less threatening. The problem with carrier landings is the main reason the Corsair is first supplied to land-based marine units like Pappy Boeington's Black Sheep Squadron. Yet despite its problems, when the Corsair finally enters service in early 1943, it's an instant hit. Compared to the F-4F Wildcats the Leathernecks flew previously, the Corsair is far superior in virtually every way. It may not possess the tough little Wildcats' legendary ruggedness, but it's so much better in speed and rate of climb that most Marine pilots don't care. And like the Wildcat, the Corsair also has some excellent defensive features. Most notably, a heavy piece of armor plate directly behind the pilot. Yeah, they did have an armor plate behind the pilot, and uh, I'm sure as the pilot was getting shot at, you know, his shoulders would start to get more and more narrow as he hid behind that armor plate, but uh, at least he had something to hide behind. So really nice offensive features, pretty good defensive features, and overall, what a great plane. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. From what I've seen so far, it looks like the F4U Corsair has a big edge in performance over even the very latest models of the Zero. Does that mean Pappy Bolington will have it easy during his tangle with the Zeros over a ball in January 1944? Not by a long shot. But then again, Pappy Bolington is used to taking long odds and winning them big. Every dogfight is a battle that combines man and machine. A unique blend of cold, hard technology with human instinct, intellect, and passion. At their very best, 
combat pilots virtually meld with their aircraft, the plane becoming an almost living extension of the person who flies it. Gregory Boynton is just such a pilot. Like a lot of future World War II aces, his passion for flying started early. Really, what inspired him to have a desire to fly was a childhood ride in an airplane that visited his town. And that was common when he was a boy during that era in the 1920s. They were called barnstormers. And these people would fly from town to town and put on air shows and also give rides. And he was hooked from then on. And the cadet program, which he entered, came about in the mid-1930s and offered the opportunity to a, a good paying job in the Depression and an opportunity to fulfill that desire to fly. But even though he's achieved his dream of flying, this is far from the end of the rainbow for Boynton. Indeed, his entire life is an uphill battle against the same long odds he'll face over a ball in 1944. Almost from birth, Gregory Boynton was somebody who defied the odds. He had a lot of childhood near misses as far as accidents are concerned. He was very rough and tumble on the schoolyard. He never shied away from a fight, even if he didn't have much of a chance to win. And he would keep attacking an opponent, even if that person had beaten him before. So he had an aggressive spirit and just a, a knack of, uh, of surviving against the odds. And uh, really, those served him well when uh, he decided to become a Marine and uh, fly for the Marine Corps. Yet these very same qualities also have a downside, especially in an outfit that's as dedicated to strict discipline as the U.S. Marine Corps. He was obstinate, um, and he was really unconventional. He wasn't a spit and polished Marine in appearance, and he would butt heads with superior officers just because of his personality. His Marine Corps career was not going very well because of his conduct. Then in 1941, several months before the U.S. is forced into World War II, Boynton joins the American Volunteer Group. Nicknamed the Flying Tigers, the AVG fights against the Japanese, who invade China in 1937. These pilots, even though supporting the Chinese government, they were flying uh, for a company, and the Chinese government would pay that company for the kills they accumulated. And so it was certainly in Boynton's best interest to score as many kills as possible. And for all the pilots, it was a chance to uh, make some money and also just have the thrill of flying in combat. It's in China that Boynton first displays his outstanding abilities as a combat pilot. He loved to fight, so that was one attribute right there. But he also had that that special knack of survival. He had a sixth sense that he knew when he could go into a situation, and then he also knew when to have some caution. And he always had that belief that no matter how tough it got, it was going to be OK. And as one flying tiger told me, Boynton could uh, sit up all night drinking, and then the next day outfly almost anybody. So that shows his inherent talent as a pilot. When the US does enter the war following the attack on Pearl Harbor, Boynton transfers back to the Marines. Shortly afterwards, he takes command of VMF 214, the Black Sheep Squadron. It's here that he gets a nickname, but it's not the one he's famous for. It was around the time that the Navy issued this cartoon. It was called Grandpa Pettibone. And what this was was a training aid. It was this old man, this old geezer, who would tell you in the message of the cartoon what you were doing wrong as far as aviation was concerned. And Boynton, even though he wasn't the oldest person in the squadron, he was near the oldest, so they took to calling him Gramps. And that's what all the pilots called him. They never really called him Pappy at all. Ironically, the nickname Pappy is partly the result of Boynton's heavy drinking, a problem that will trouble him throughout his life. There was one pilot, Lieutenant Mullen, who knew a drinking song from Yale. And the name Gramps didn't quite fit into the lyrics he coined. So he chose Pappy, which did fit in. And the, the press seized on the name Pappy because of that drinking song. Pappy Boynton quickly leads the black sheep to fame during their epic air battles over a ball. This is especially true when Pappy's kill total starts to mount, each day getting closer to the hallowed figure of 26. That was a hallowed figure because Eddie Rickenbacker had achieved that in World War I. So that was really the mark that you wanted to attain if Boynton was marching towards that mark when he was flying. So that was really what his command tour existed of, was flying repeated missions to Rabaul. How does Pappy achieve so many kills so quickly? 
Part of the answer is his amazing flying skill. Another is the great technical capability of his F4U Corsair. But as we know, there's also a third element, tactics. Not surprisingly, Pappy's aerial tactics mirror his aggressive personality. One of Pappy's favorite tactics was to dive on his uh, victim from out of the sun, dive below the target's altitude, and pull up in his blind spot underneath to very close range before he opened fire. Sometimes he waited and, and got so close before he opened fire that the target would explode in his face and little pieces would damage his aircraft. Normally he fought in a section with a wingman, but he was very aggressive and he didn't hesitate to continue a fight if he lost his wingman. On the other side, the Japanese are not only upgrading the Zero, but are also changing their tactics. About this time, the Japanese Navy was in transition from the three-plane Shotai to the four-plane Buntai. The reason for this was that after the initial attack, each pilot would engage and fight individually. This took a lot of experience to be able to do that. By this point in the war, the Japanese Navy had lost most of its experienced pilots. By arranging a uh, four-ship flight, the Buntai, then it only took one experienced leader to lead a four-ship flight. And then they could actually fight in two-ship elements, the more experienced leader uh, leading the less experienced wingman. By January 1944, Poppy Bowington is on the verge of breaking Eddie Rickenbacker's record of 26 victories. U.S. planes, including his Black Sheep Squadron, pound Rabaul on an almost daily basis. But the Zeros defending Rabaul still have plenty of fight left. The stage is set for Pappy's mission on January 3rd. January 3rd, 1944. Major Gregory Pappy Boyson is leading a section of four F-4U Corsairs from his squadron as part of a large fighter sweep over the Japanese stronghold of Rabaul. By this time of the war, there's an unofficial race between several U.S. aces to see who will break the World War I legend Eddie Rickenbacker's record of 26 victories. With 25 kills, Pappy is just one away, and everyone in his corner wants to see him break it first. Among them is Pappy's wingman, Captain George Ashman. Hey, Grant, you go ahead and shoot all you want. I'll just keep him off your tail. Roger that, Georgie boy. Thanks. Pappy's section is at 20,000 feet as they complete the 200-mile flight from Rabaul to the base in Bougainville. They've arrived ahead of the other 44 U.S. fighters assigned to today's sweep. With their supercharged double wasp engines, the Corsairs fly beautifully at this altitude. The Mitsubishi Zeros are still the mainstay of Japanese fighter forces and can also get up this high. And speaking of Zeros, there's a group of them a few thousand people below and they're climbing up to engage. Pappy spots them. And as is typical, he ain't gonna wait for other American fighters to get down there before him. Let's go down there and get to work, boys. Without looking behind to see what the other pair of Corsairs is doing, Pappy wings over and dies into attack. And Ashman's right with him. Uh-oh. Now we might have a problem here. The rest of Pappy's section is not following him. Maybe there was trouble with his radio transmission. Maybe they think he's out to lunch. I don't know. But whatever it is, Pappy and Asham are diving into a swarm of enemy fighters. And so far, they're completely unsupported. But neither Pappy nor Ashman see this. They're totally focused on the Zeros. Pappy lines up on the first Zero he sees and opens up with a long burst from his Corsair's 650 caliber machine guns. The bullets chew right through the lightly constructed Japanese fighter, puncturing his fuel tank in several places. Unlike U.S. fighters, Zero's tanks are not self-sealing. And it quickly bursts into flames. Hey, Gramps, you got a flamer. That ties the record. Thanks, Georgie boy. Let's go get some more. Yeah, but where are the rest of the guys? Ashman has noticed that the other pair of black sheep are nowhere in sight. I don't know, kid, but we ain't got time to find them. There's about ten bandits dead ahead. And Pappy's right. There's a formation of about ten more Zeros vectoring right for them. Pappy and Ashton open fire and charge straight through the Zeros. 
Scattering in all directions like throwing a rock at a hornet's nest. Hey, Grant, here comes the cavalry. Ashford has spotted the rest of the U.S. fighters in the sweep, diving in from high altitude. It's about time. And here they come. Oh, brother. Pappy and Ashford have got a real problem now. Those aren't U.S. fighters. They're zeros. About 20 of them. Holy crap, Grant. They're bandits. But Pappy keeps his head in the game. Stay cool, Georgie boy. Commence the thatch weave, understand? Commence the thatch weave. Understood. What a great call by Pappy. The thatch weave was a tactic devised by U.S. Naval Aviator John Thatch, who first used it in the Battle of Midway in 1942. It calls for the defending aircraft to weave back and forth in such a way that any attacking zero will be dragged directly in the line of fire of other defending planes. Although it was originally conceived as a way for the older F-4F Wildcat to neutralize the superiority of the zero, there's no reason why it can't work with Corsairs 2. And it is working. The attacking zero drivers seem confused. They don't know what the hell's going on. None of them are able to get a good firing angle on the Corsairs. And one of the zeros doesn't pull out of his firing pass fast enough, and Ashram gets a good angle on him. He fires, and the zero explodes into a massive fireball. Nice shoot, Georgie boy. Thanks, Grant. Pappy gets a shot at another zero. It flames and goes down, too. That breaks Rickenbacker's record. You see that one, George? We did it. But there's no answer. Pappy looks over and sees that Ashram's plane is smoking and starting to go down into a shallow dive. It must have been hit while Pappy was flaming that last zero. Now this not only breaks up the Corsair's weave, but also makes Ashram a magnet for all the other zeros in the area, who immediately pounce on his crippled Corsair like a pack of hyenas. For God's sake, George, die. Pappy knows that their Corsairs can easily outdive the Zeros, but there's no answer for Ashram. His smoking plane continues its descent as zero after zero makes a firing pass at it. For God's sake, George dies straight down. Still nothing from Ashram. Either his radio is out or he's too badly wounded to answer. Pappy slides in behind the Zeros at a rake in Ashram from the stern. There's so many that he doesn't even bother to use his gun sight. He's just seesawing back and forth on his rudder pedals, trying to spray all of them in general. Trying to get them off Ashram's tail long enough for him to bail out, or dive, or do anything. Yet another group of Zeros is gathering behind Pappy's Corsair. And they're opening up on him too. How the hell is he gonna get out of this? January 3rd, 1944, Pappy Boynton is in the fight of his life. While trying to save his wingman from a group of attacking Japanese Zeros during a fighter sweep over a ball, Pappy's Corsair has just been jumped by another group of Zeros. Pappy weaves and shakes, but his Corsair is still being shredded by enemy fire. Thank God for the armor plate behind him or Pappy would be a dead man by now. George Ashram's fighter is in even worse shape. Finally bursts into flames and plunges straight down into the water, which is now just a few thousand feet below. Happy knows there's nothing he can do now but try and escape with his life. He firewalls the throttle and puts his plane into a shallow dive to try and pick up as much speed as he can. Yet when he gets through the water, he has to level off. Even though the Corsair is much faster than the Zeros, Happy's lost a lot of speed while trying to shoot the Zeros off of Ashwood's tail. And the zeros above them have the advantage of being able to pick up speed as they dive down to make their firing passes. But Pappy slowly pulling away from him as that big double wasp churns that 13 and a half foot prop through the air. And it looks like he's gonna make it. There are now only a few zeros left that have any chance of getting a shot at Pappy's Corsair. And one of them tries in desperation. A long range burst from his wing mounted 20 millimeter cannons. 
All the shots go wide, but one round slams into the Corsair's main fuel tank. Right in front of Pappy. Well, if that isn't a bad turn of events for Pappy, he's in a hell of a fix now. And now his Corsair is nearly done. But he's so low to the water that there's hardly enough altitude for a safe bailout. My god, he's bailing out anyways. There's just enough altitude for his chute to open before he hits the water. And it looks like Pappy's made it. He survived. But the remaining Zeros are right on top of him, and they are still up for blood. They make a few striping passage, but luckily Pappy's not hit. And here come a group of U.S. fighters. It must be the rest of the planes in the fighter sweep. And lucky for Pappy, because they quickly chase off the last of those Zeros. Badly injured Pappy struggles into his plane's emergency left draft, which is floating nearby. A few hours later, he's picked up and captured by a Japanese submarine. It's the end of the war for Major Gregory Pappy Boynton. For Pappy Boynton, January 3rd is a bad day all around. Not only will he now be a Japanese prisoner for the rest of the war, but also his wingman George Ashman is killed. Besides the loss of a friend, that means there's no witness to confirm Pappy's later claim of two victories, which would have made him the first to break Eddie Rickenbacker's US record of 26. Instead, that honor goes to P-38 ace Richard Bong, who achieves the feat on April 12, 1944, more than three months after Pappy's dogfight over a ball. Ironically, the chase for Rickenbacker's record probably also plays a key role in Pappy's shootdown. At the time of this engagement, Pappy was worn out from two weeks of constant combat, trying to beat Eddie Rickenbacker's record. He uh, had instructed his entire flight to make an attack at once, uh, rather than leaving any fighters high for high cover. As it turned out, part of his flight stayed high anyway, and uh, Pappy lost situation awareness and didn't realize that it was just him and his wingman down there at low level fighting with these zeros. Yet mistakes like this can't dim the luster of Pappy's amazing record. When he returns to America after the war, he's given a hero's welcome. He found out he had been recommended for the Medal of Honor and uh, was presented uh, that medal by President Truman at the White House. However, now that Pappy's home and makes his claim for the pair of victories during his final mission, the entire issue becomes highly contentious. There were no eyewitnesses, so he had the record changed and uh, to bring the kill total up to 28, which made him the leading Marine Corps ace over Joe Foss, which still creates controversy to this day. Always a magnet for trouble, Pappy continues to find it. He had a tragic life afterwards. His alcoholism continued. He went through numerous marriages, numerous careers. He was a, a wrestling official at one time. Uh, with the rise of the television program, Black Sheep, he alienated a lot of members of the squadron because that television show did not portray the squadron as it really was. And really, his health declined uh, later in life. You see pictures of him in his early 60s. He looks like a man much older. He looks like a man really beaten by life because he had had a hard life physically and eventually died of cancer in 1988. There's an old saying, when the legend conflicts with the facts, go with the legend. So perhaps it's best to remember Gregory Boynton as the Pappy of legend, that intrepid combat pilot who blazed a trail of glory across the skies of China and the South Pacific, a pugnacious brawler who could defeat every enemy he met, except one, himself. Throughout World War II, the F-4U Corsair had an 11 to 1 kill ratio against Japanese aircraft. Statistically, that made it one of the deadliest fighters in the entire Pacific theater. On the other side, the Zero, which dominated the air war early, was almost obsolete by 1944. That it was overtaken by planes like the Corsair is a testament to US designers who were determined to build the very best aircraft in the world. 
but in the right circumstances, even a pilot as good as Pappy Boynton could still get shot down by the Zero. And that is a testament to the designers and the pilots who built and flew these classic Japanese warbirds. I'm Major Paul Moga. I'll see you next time on Showdown Air Combat.